I'm so excited to announce the next panel for the very first time. Uh, oh yeah, the panel name again, Creativity and Humor and Challenging Fundamentalisms and Defense. Yeah, you can read up. <laughs> it. It's a mouthful, but I am really excited to announce the panelists. Betty recently won an award for her creativity and she's going to do the opening remarks for this panel. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you to each and every one of you for being here with us. Uh, this morning, we delve into the fascinating intersection of creativity, humor, activism, and freedom of expression. Um, to open the dance, for those of you who don't know, I uh, founded the organization, the Movement Mali, first made a name for itself in 2009 by organizing a picnic during uh, Ramadan in Morocco. Creativity often serves as a powerful tool for exploring and challenging societal norms. It provides a platform to express dissent and imagine alternative futures, thereby contributing to political discourse. Creativity provides um, freedom of expression, allows for open dialogue and debate, which are essential for social progress and reform. It enables people to share their experiences and push back against fundamentalism and oppressive system. Creativity provides platform for voices that might otherwise go unheard. Mali is a feminist-like movement of civil disobedience. Creativity, humor, freedom of expression, and civil disobedience are interconnected in their roles in advocating for individual liberties, human and women's rights. The creative approach can help garner media attention and public support, not only highlighting injustices, but also pushing the boundaries of what is possible. Yes, by using creative tactics, we challenge conventional norms and provoke thoughts on sensitive issues like freedom of conscience, laicity, sex-based violence, and patriarchal oppression. Through our work as activists, artists, artivists tackling taboos, we aim to reduce stigma. We can challenge stereotypes, draconian laws, conservative society, religious ideology, blasphemy, and propose new ways, uh, new waves of engaging with the world. We run in our movement, for example, three campaigns against the patriarchal myth of female virginity and all forms of male violence that result, result from it. The first one was my uh, digital, um, digital campaign, My Vulva is Mine. The second one, a fake website, like the IKEA website, to order a virginity set, but when we clicked on the link, there were awareness-raising videos and testimonials. And the third one, in 2022 was a digital illustrated book in three languages. And I invite you to take a look at the printed version I have uh, here. Well, it's such a pleasure to be here today to discuss and consider how creative expression can both drive forward the ideals of feminism and human rights, how it can humanize topics and inspire action by connecting emotionally with audiences. Activism is subversive, otherwise it's just entertainment. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Let's start with you while you just did the opening remarks. Your documentary, The Kiss in Morocco, received a lot of backlash, but you also have an organization that is focused in Morocco as well. Tell us a bit more about the organization and how you use creativity in like the documentary to do your activism. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the invitation. So, okay, Mali, as I said, is a movement based in Morocco. It's a civil disobedient um, uh, movement, feminist and the universalist and laic movement, fighting for individual liberties and women's rights uh, against the Islamic patriarchy and against social and the religious inquisition. 
uh, Morocco is a country which is an absolute monarchy by divine rights. So it's uh, also the first LGBT movement in Morocco, uh, fighting for sexual and reproductive rights as well. Uh, we organized, for example, um, a photography exhibition uh, to fight um, against state homophobia in Morocco. We have an article in the penal called Criminalizing um, Homosexuality. Um, we, we organized this exhibition with Dutch embassy, for example, and this created a big diplomatic incident in Morocco. Uh, in another campaign against state homophobia, I was kissing uh, a woman in a picture, so I received a lot of, um, of um, threats, and uh, I was victim of uh, harassment because of this picture and this campaign. Um, we launched a campaign against uh, for sexual freedom, sorry, because in Morocco, uh, sexual intercourse uh, is uh, forbidden uh, outside marriage, actually. So the campaign for sexual freedom is uh, was uh, in 2016, maybe, or something like that. Get those judges out of our pants. And with the um, visuals, like panties uh, stretch in, um, on a clothesline, you know, and we sent all the posters to, to um, some ministers. <laughs> um, I have a lot of, uh, of actions and campaign, but like one of them, uh, we, in 2017, we colored in red, um, um, the water of, um, of some fountains in Rabat, the capital of Morocco, to raise awareness of uh, violence against women. I was prosecuted because of this action, this symbolic action, this uh, happening. The trial took place five years later. I explained that it was an artistic performance, but the judge, the judge disagreed. But I explained uh, what's the meaning of this um, action, etc. Anyway, I was found innocent. Um, a last a last uh, example. We invited uh, in 2012 a big NGO from um, Netherlands, Women on Waves. Um, it was a big action um, for abortion rights and uh, decriminalize uh, abortion in Morocco. Uh, and so Few, few, few years later, we organized another big action. We stuck menstrual pads with fake blood and pro-choice messages on the wall of the Ministry of Health. So, yeah, in Morocco, we, we are known uh, because of our um, symbolic action happenings and um, campaigns. Um, and uh, uh, as we are uh, disobedient, we, we help pregnant women to get an abortion with abortion pills for free in Morocco. And for that, I'm facing like for five to ten years imprisonment because I do it publicly. But I have a question, um, or my question is, does creative mean provocative? So... Thank you. <laughs> I guess this is uh, a good segue for maybe Mariam to start answering and then the rest of the panel to go on. Mariam, your TED talk was censored. You had run-ins with the British council, uh, council Muc Muslim councils for the Allah's gay slogan. But on top of that, X, you know, the platform that we all love, yeah. also tend to, like, just recently censored you as well. So how do you navigate between this world and also answering Betty's question? Is all our creativity and activism leading towards um, provocation? Um, I think um, the, the thing with creativity is that uh, we really have uh, very few options in order to resist a very dark, brutal, violent, misogynist movement and ideas. Um, and so, in a sense, uh, our response, of course, cannot be the same hateful violence that we're faced with, because that's what we're trying to challenge. And so, in a way, when you think about it, the only thing we can do is to speak up and to do it in a way that one pokes fun at uh, those in power, the fundamentalists, because as Shabana said very often, is that when you're laughing, you're not as afraid. 
and also uh, it takes away their power because they rely on fear and uh, you know people being too afraid to speak, being too afraid to put their heads up and say no. And I think this sort of creativity and humor, uh, it, it makes people laugh and it makes them feel that it's okay to criticize and to, to resist and to, to say no. So I feel like um, it's important to do. It's, it is obviously provocative, but I always ask, you know, why is an Allah is gay sign provocative? when you know you have so many signs at gay pride for example saying jesus has two dads or um you know a god is a woman we we hear often why is it so provocative and in fact the question should be uh what's wrong with being gay uh, first of all uh, but also the the real question is are we being provocative or are we responding to a hateful and violent provocation? They are provoking us. They are provoking us with their threats and their hate and their violence. And we are standing firm and refusing and resisting. And so in a sense, we have no choice. They, when they fuck off, we'll go on and do you know, our regular lives. But until then, we're standing firm, we're fighting them, and we're gonna be provocative uh, because this is our right to expression, our right to uh, live the way we choose. And, um, you know, I think it, it, it helps to make people laugh. It helps people, it makes people feel more comfortable. It opens up the space for debate. It humanizes the, the discussions. Um, and I think it's really important to do, particularly given the movements that we're faced with. Thank you, Maria. Moving, moving over to you, I mean, you've, you know, you've founded Femin and you've received backlash and, you know, the video that we just saw, you know, so, so many, so many contradictions, but you've gone and like founded this movement um, and also survived a terrorist attack. Tell us more about Femin. Tell us more about what led you to this and why did you choose, you know, the Femin to be a representation of um, challenging fundamentalism? Um, I think you know that one of the things I've done very well in my life is not following the rules. So allow me to answer your question with a question as well. Um, you know, I think that there will be a lot of testimonies today and uh, many of us will testify on um, various forms of oppression that um, um, men and women face. And indeed, there are many countries where men and women are oppressed, uh, where men and women are both are not free. There are also many countries where men are more free than women. And lately, I think we've seen a lot of examples as well. And I would like to challenge you to name one only one country where women are free and men are not. <laughs> Such country does not exist, right? And there is, of course, a reason. Because, indeed, um, all authoritarians, all fundamentalists, all of them, they have very severe allergic reaction to two things. One is robust debates, free speaking voices, and second is autonomy of women. And if they all have a manual, I imagine sometimes that they all have this one sacred book, you know, how to oppress. And there is this one chapter, things to absolutely control, um, women and women's bodies of course, will be written in a very bold and probably not very pretty font. Um, so yes, women's bodies, um, we discovered through our fight uh, that women's bodies have this incredible power, not only of you know, provoking or triggering reactions, but it has an incredible power of revealing and showing the cracks of those authoritarians, of those fundamentalists, of those fanatics, of their systems and their ideologies. 
because the indeed the reactions and the um, the, the the backlash we get after simply removing a top unwillingly, right? That something that they don't want. This is one of those cases of nudity that they don't like. They did they do not expect and they did not request this nudity that is not wanted. That comes in uncomfortable position, in uncomfortable moment, in uncomfortable place. Um, and it also speaks, even without voice, but with some words written across the chest. That's something that we use in our protest. We, we saw how this simple act, to many ridiculous act, to some banal act, indeed, could show how fragile are those powerful, presumably powerful and scary um, systems, groups, and ideologies. Um, and you know, there will be a lot of people who will talk about the context of Islam in this, in this room. Um, and I think that it's my role to remind that there are other authoritarian systems and other authoritarian regimes that are very much connected and very much rely on religious orthodoxy. And they use exactly the same methods. Um, and of course, I, I'm here to probably, it's my role to remind about uh, such countries like Russia. And I think that not many people today realize or know in the West to what extent Russian Orthodox Church is, is a pillar of what is called, very often called Putin's regime. And the war that is, uh, Russia is waging today in my homeland is very much you know, the whole propaganda, war propaganda, is very much built on religious orthodoxy. The Russian Orthodox Church is very much involved. They're the main propagandists of this war. Um, uh, Patriarch Kirill uh, promises everyone to forgive their sins for going uh, to another country and killing people. Um, there are priests who are blessing uh, with holy water tanks that go to invade Ukraine. Um, so all those, you know, and of course the, the calls of uh, those male priests in dresses for women to give more births, to, to birth more soldiers. Um, those things we hear every day in Russian language. Um, so uh, that's why, you know, woman's body is something that is certainly a tool in our art arsenal, that it became a tool in our arsenal, an incredibly powerful tool that we did not expect ourselves, that it, it will become as such. Um, it's, it's indeed something that we realized. It's one of those few things that no um, fundamentalist, religious fundamentalist, no authoritarian can absolutely control, can impose an, ab can impose an absolute control. And going beyond feminine, which is something you know that um, I think lasted for very long and then transformed into various other forms, similar forms of resistance, going beyond feminine, I think that today we see those powerful acts of resistance of women using their bodies against the most oppressive, the most frightening regimes. Of course, Iran. Those women who take off the headscarves and they don't reveal, you know, their their naked skin. They show just the other part of their body, hair, or the voice, as you said, that comes out of this female body. Um, this uh, body that moves and dances to the music. What a crime it is to them. What a horror it is to them. They are ready to put all their force to stop those women controlling their or using or enjoying their own bodies. And of course, another tool that I've particularly been enjoying using in our activist arsenal is blasphemy. And it must sound to you like I'm repeating myself because indeed woman, free woman is a blasphemy. It is a definition of blasphemy to all of them. And you know, uh, blasphemy is something, it, it's not about you know, provoking for the sake of provocation, even though this is, it, there's been a time um, I was enjoying doing just that. Um, but blasphemy, I think uh, we, we've seen that it is really an incredible um, form of art. It is a pure art of questioning. Because if we really analyze what have been called, what have been considered Blasphemous, the most bright examples, biggest examples of blasphemy. What, what? What can you name? A book, a theater piece, a drawing, 
a song. It's, it's, it is indeed, blasphemy requires creativity. Blasphemy requires artistic forms of challenging dogmas, of challenging those who claim their authority to define what is sacred, of those who claim their authority and their exclusive right to, um, to truth. And uh, we all know that all truth, uh, all real truth, all began as blasphemy. And so um, I think that uh, those two things have, have proven in my fight, uh, have proven in fight of many women in this room and many women, uh, many people we will mention as examples, as really powerful arsenals. And I always use this, this opportunity to, to say, don't be afraid to flesh your naked, to flesh your skin. And don't be afraid to blaspheme, because indeed, you know, Betty, you said, should creativity be uh, provocative, controversial? Any act, any creative act is provocative to authoritarians and fundamentalists. Any, any expression of creativity or freedom of, of thought um, will be provocative. So it's not, again, the, the, the labels of provocation or controversy is not on us. It's on them. Um, what we are doing, we want to simply exist. Uh, we want to enjoy ourselves, our bodies, our freedom. Uh, we want to question, we want to doubt, we want to change our opinions, we want to change our beliefs, we want to um, shift from one uh, ideology to another. That's what we claim to be our right. And that is a big problem to them. So again, we're doing a very banal thing. What is not banal is their reaction and their um, attacks on us. Yes, many of us have survived terrorist attacks. I did as well. Many of us have been imprisoned. I did as well. Many of us had to flee our own countries because we decided you know, that we enjoy singing or dancing or speaking out. Or we decided to, that it's, we want to claim women's rights and we want to, to, to fight for my own case, I want to defend my own case as a woman in, in the country I was born. So those very banal things, they are banal if you really think about them. But once they are um, done in the face of those who um, protect themselves with uh, religious orthodoxy and claims of God and uh, want to claim power over um, a group of people or entire society and especially women, this becomes provocation. And the film that um, we are finishing, so you are actually the first audience that have seen some footage from this film. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I want to thank you for every giggle. This made me really, um, I'm, I'm, I, I'm really excited. Um, the film will be two hours, so I hope that there will be more opportunities to giggle and to clap and um, to boo uh, as well. And this is an extension, of course, an extension of, of everything that have been done uh, in the last decade, um, of those protests, of writing um, and speaking. and. Um, I explore this question, this conflict between women's rights and um, monotheistic religions. And um, why I decided to do it is because I think um, I had a very big disappointment and deception. It, this, this intention Sorry. to make this film, yes, I finished, I know, um, it comes out from deception that I think that there is um, us women with uh, all the differences that we have, we lately stopped talking to each other, um, stopped, stopped communicating with each other. And I think that I have been very much disappointed by the fact that many ex-Muslim women, many women in Muslim countries have been failed by Western feminists. And so with this intention, I went into this journey to talk to all kinds of women to, from different backgrounds and once again to just to use this opportunity to claim that girls are gods. So I hope for your support and I hope that this will be uh, um, another tool for all of us to spread our message. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Sorry, we're short on time, so if you could keep your responses brief, and then we'll, we'll, I think we'll just have like five minutes of questions just to give the rest of the speakers a chance to talk. But Haram Doodles, this is the very first time you're here. 
Wait, wait. Wait, wait, I'll announce it. There's a big face reveal Hold coming. On. You know what? Yeah. Fuck this. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm just gonna pick this up because you know Norwegians don't like littering. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, all good. Um, so you've you've started your I want to say um, activism, but bringing the voice through your art, your your doodles on Instagram. What led you to start this as you know as an ex-Muslim? Why did you choose this form to you know yeah. provoke people or be blasphemous? <laughs> um. I think as an immigrant kid living in the US, I honestly always wondered why does Allah hate everything that's fun and funny? Like why? It was such a like always doom and gloom every time Islam came up. It was like as if like the energy was sucked out of the room and you're like, okay, I guess I gotta be serious now. I can't laugh. You know, you can't make fun of anything. And it was moments like every time I heard the call to prayer, my little kid brain would be like, oh, fuck, there's that man again. And then you realize that's Islam in a nutshell. <laughs> um, I, loved, I loved drawing as a kid, um, but I was always told that you know, Allah would make me bring all of my drawings to life when I'd be punished and burned in hell. And... Um, and that I was being misled by Satan. But honestly, my pencils, my paper, my mind, it all felt like those safe places where I could really create and think whatever I wanted to without anyone finding out what I was doing or what I was thinking. And I was willing to take my chances in hell as well. <laughs> Let Allah burn me. <laughs> um, but I really do believe that I think once you start to let go of the fear, you really do start to, you know, see the light side of it. You start to make fun of everything in front of you, especially when I started to really kind of research. And as I think when you grow up as a Muslim, you're told everything pretty subjectively until you start actually looking into the Quran and you start reading the Hadith. And, and then I was like, wait, there's one chapter on women? I, where's the chapter on men, first of all? And then the whole chapter on women is like, your wives, your women. And I'm like, but where is that information for me? For me as a woman, I'm looking for, okay, what do I do about my menstrual health? But apparently it says, oh yeah, men don't have sex when women are menstruating. And that was it. And you're, you know, at, as you're growing up and as you're like in going into adulthood, just none of these things made sense to me. And finally, I think around the pandemic time, I really, for years and years, kept going, what do I do? What do I do? How do I talk about this? Do I do stand-up comedy? Do I, I don't know, write a book? Um, and then I finally was like, you know what? Let me actually go back to my childhood passion of drawing. And really kind of create another way for ex-Muslims to find belonging. And really, I think that's what led me to, and actually also finding the ex-Muslim subreddit was really amazing because it really allowed me to see and hear from other ex-Muslims that we're honestly dealing with a lot of the same things I was. Yes, we all have our differences. Yes, we all come from different places. And at the same time, there's a lot of similarities among us and especially that apostasy and blasphemy are punishable by death. And as much as that apparently should scare us, I'm actually going, you know what, I don't even care anymore. That's literally why I took my mask off today too, because I was like, you know what, I'm in a mask, I'm scared. I'm not scared anymore, I'm, I'm actually just done. <laughs> so yeah, um, I think for me it's just, if. Every doodle or any doodle can bring a little bit of belonging for any ex-Muslim out there. If it can bring, bring a laugh, it can, it can bring a cry, it can validate those feelings, it can make you feel seen or heard, that's more than enough for me. Thank you so much. On TikTok, we're seeing Iranian women 
you know, protesting, throwing off their hijabs, and I know there is a lot more after this panel on that. But Faravaz, the simple act of singing has led you to leave your home. Mm -hmm. The simple act of just, you know, the rhythm, the music, but also your lyrics, even if I don't understand the Persian ones, I still dance to it, it's catchy. Tell us more about what led you to take that brave act from singing at home to singing in public and really protesting and demonstrating for women in Iran to have that basic right. Hi again. Honestly, I didn't feel that I'm brave. And I didn't feel, when I was in Iran, in Iran, I mean, I didn't feel like I'm fighting. I just love to sing. And uh, I always, when I was in Iran, and I, that I, had an, I had a slogan. It was like, I'm singing to be alive. Because um, I, had a, I, had, I have a really old parents. And um, the society has nothing to offer to a young woman in Iran. And um, I was out of market of dating because I was fat and ugly with the standard, which is uh, working in Iran. And uh, I somehow start, I didn't, I had really low confidence. I couldn't find any friends. I started to sing and singing brought me so many friends, so many love, and I found my love of my life, finally, which was music, and um, it changed my life. And um, I was thinking, okay, I'm not earning money, I'm not doing any concert, I cannot sell my records, but I'm happy because I can do something, I can, create a um, new kind of music, uh, mixing different genres, and uh, for the first time, Iranian can hear uh, this kind of music with a female voice, uh, which is living in that time. And, um, and I was like, okay, I'm wearing hijab, I'm not singing about politics, not, nothing gonna happen. And, uh, but unfortunately it happened, it happened, or luckily, I don't know, it has bad and good results at the end. And um, yes, and uh, that was the moment I realized, okay, your time is over here and I had to leave. And uh, as I told, I got a one year of jail sentence. I was too scared to tell, tell my parents that I'm criminal and I have a jail sentence and they didn't know what happened till they watched my first interview in Germ when I was in Germany. And then they realized that why I left. Because till that moment I was a bad girl who didn't love her parents enough and she left. And um, till that time I was um, I was thinking how to can help other women, especially other female singers in my country. And uh, I wanted to somehow bring them all out of that ho uh, like shithole, I can say. <laughs> and I realized I'm too weak to do that and it's not something which could work forever. And we have to bring change in another way. That's why I created the right to sing campaign and then later charity. And um, I started to bring awareness to the West because nobody knew that women cannot sing in Iran. And uh, only because of singing they can be criminal, prison and jail and yeah. And um, I started to talk about it more and more. I became more activist and being a singer because I was pissed at my voice because I had to suffer a lot because of having this voice. And I didn't sing for a long time. And um, I think it's uh, around the two years that I'm singing again and using my voice to make them angry and fuck them up. And, <laughs> and um, I'm trying to help Iranian female singers who are living in still inside of country because they are brave enough to sing even the government doesn't let them to sing because the only problem they have, the biggest problem they have is like they don't have money to create music and Iranian men are not enough kind to support them, unfortunately. <laughs> and uh, 
that's what I try to do to help them if they leave the country, how to survive in exile, because uh, our music business outside of Iran is super toxic and small and lead by men who hate us, especially like women who doesn't want to be their slave, and uh, how they start their new life in exile, how to produce sing, song if they live in, still in the country, living still in the country. And that's what I'm trying to do, besides making them angry. <laughs> and um, yes, but something is really interesting. When I was a teenager, I was watching a YouTube, which is hard in Iran to watch YouTube because inter internet is like um, filtered. And I was watching a video of a uh, famine and I was like, I want to one day become topless with them. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> um, and I did. And that was the last thing I could do to be boycotted from all the Iranian community. <laughs> I disconnected all my connections. But I'm glad I did it. It makes me much more brave and depends on myself, not my connections, and find the people who doesn't want to push me in their fucking boxes. And um, yes, Thank I don't want to continue much. too long. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to, like I mentioned, we'll have five minutes of question, but I kind of want to open up the floor to you ladies to talk about what you know the other have said. I think there's a lot of alignment with being a woman, being creative, our bodies, and obviously being provocative. I want to ask you, how do young, you know, new upcoming artists, you know, I know Farvaz, you're supporting, how do, they, how do they get into this space? There is this idea of Islamophobia that is also blocking, you know, like really trying to censor us as well. So ladies, please take the floor and uh, maybe Mariam, you can start the conversation. Or I will continue. Really, I want to say something short. I live in Berlin, in Germany, and I said thousands of no from every record labels, every booking agencies, and um, I do everything by my own, which is really exhausting. And I believe that all comes from of my political message. And this is so important that we all sit here together and support each other and book each other, even if we are expensive, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, because it's a really risky topic and um, it makes us scary. And uh, for them, I mean. And um, yeah, it just I think we need to be louder and louder and repeat what we say, as you told, uh, till one day we heard. Yeah. I will only take two questions, but I want the ladies to take. Have yeah, I just wanted to, to say one word. Um, it very much touches me the fact that there are Iranian women who I can just imagine, you know, you were sitting in Iran watching the video. Um, a famine running naked in Ukraine, screaming those slogans or in Paris. And I remember that's also how I met uh, Rana Ahmad, who is here, right? Yes, uh, she told me that in Saudi Arabia, she was um, she created a fake account on Twitter and um, she was watching uh, famine photos. And um, um, it's, it's um, of course, uh, to um, outline how universal this um, this problem, this fight against us is, and therefore how universal is this um, tool that we all possess, our body, um, female body, free f female body that is striving um, to get back its independence and freedom, how universal those things are. And um, again, you know, that's how we also met with Maria Namazi in Paris, who just came from London to join um, a naked topless protest of uh, Muslim women, ex-Muslim women against hijab. That was 2010, I think. Um, 
So again, you know, it's it's the power of this universality of this fight is so powerful and it's so great. And once again, I think that this is something very unpopular that I do um, remind, uh, you know, people, women, feminists don't like when I come up with this again and again, but I think it's very important to talk about our recent failures and how many how many times um, feminists in the West shy away from supporting um, those efforts or avoid the issues of, um, especially that is touching Islam, um, considering it, you know, this is, of course, we all know the, 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 the problems that we lately have with the ideas um, that are spread also among our, in our circles on the left. Um, uh, with multiculturalism and considering Islam um, being sort of a, 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 a equal to a race. And many feminists shy away from supporting women who are challenging Islamists. And uh, I think that this is something that we need to point out our finger uh, on and call upon those fellow sisters to speak out for those who really need to, uh, who really need support today. And I've heard from so many Iranian women who say, why are you silent? We are being killed, we are being jailed. Why are you silent now? And I think this is a big shame. And I really hope that, um, I, I, I think that they have to be shamed more and more. And us, we have to be shamed more and more because we cannot claim to defend women's rights and support women if we are doing it selectively if we are doing it only in the environments that are comfortable for us. I'm so sorry, Ina. I have to pass on the mic to Betty. Do you have? Yeah, I, I just wanted to um, add also, uh, I mean, uh, the, the issue of women in Afghanistan right now. We, we do have a speaker coming soon, but we do have the Taliban uh, that has done what it has always done, but it's made it official, really. It has silenced women's voices, uh, and this is, you know, the Taliban is the height of the Islamist movement and what religion means in women's lives. Uh, other, other religious right movements to varying degrees depending on the power they have and the legitimacy they're given. The Taliban has been given reg legitimacy. It has been given red carpet treatment to go back to Afghanistan and silence, silence, uh, you know, women. Um, and one of the campaigns uh, we're involved with is the campaign to consider sex apartheid a crime against humanity in the same way that racial apartheid is considered a crime against humanity, that sex apartheid <laughs> must be considered a crime against humanity. And of course, it's not because it has to do with women and silencing women. And so it's really up to us to make sure that women in Afghanistan and women in Iran and women elsewhere, under the, the, the boot of the religious right. I know, you know, with Islam, this is the context that we work in, and it's so brutal and so violent, particularly because it's the only places where, for example, there's the death penalty for apostasy and blasphemy, where women can still be stoned to death in the 21st century. Uh, you know, but, but other religious right movements in various ways are also, um, implementing a mass assault on women's bodies and their lives. And so we have to resist, we have no choice to resist, and we've got to do it in a way that represents um, our humanity and that puts human beings at its center. And I think that's the only way. You cannot challenge hate with hate. You cannot challenge violence with violence. It has to be done with human beings at the center. And so what we've always said is that we will denigrate and mock and poke fun at your ideas and your movements. Uh, you, they are, that is all they are worthy of. Uh, but at the same time, we will hold human beings uh, sacred and we will defend human beings irrespective of whether we agree with them or not. So I think, you know, this whole idea of offense as well, we often hear, oh, you're so offensive, it's so offensive. Oh my God, I'm so hurt, I can't manage it. My sensibilities, they're so fragile, I can't watch it. I, well, I'll have to behead you now, I hope you don't mind. I, I'm so upset and incensed. 
And you know, the point we always make is, well, we're offended by your fucking books and your religion and your Quran and your Torah and your Bible and whatnot. We're offended by that. We're offended by your religious right movements. We're offended you won't shake our hand. We're offended that you think the majority of people in hell are women. We are offended, offended, offended. But how come we can manage not to cut your head off? And how come we can manage to poke fun at you and laugh at you? And, and so that is the only way we have to open the space for people to be able to poke fun and to denigrate and to destroy ideas and movements that are destroying human beings. And laughing at them, oh my gosh, that is the best way to do it. <laughs> Becky, would you like to yeah. say a one-liner before we open yeah, it up? Yeah, because One-liner. Yeah, it's, uh, it's because like, I'm, I'm, I'm doing all that in Morocco. So uh, it, um, I want to talk about threats because I receive a real threats and I have a lot of problems because of my uh, activism in, uh, in Morocco. And uh, two or three examples, like I was on ISIS list on 2015 because of my activists. And uh, in 2016, I was arrested by um, police and I was sexually assaulted by three policemen. Um, but I was the one who was sentenced to one month uh, suspended. And um, just like uh, last but not least, uh, for the anecdote, uh, I'm being um, now prosecuted for the for a T-shirt I wore uh, at the 2022 celebrating descent in Cologne, saying Allah is lesbian. So oh, wow. that's, the, that's my conclusion. Thank you, Zara. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, ladies. We have time for one question. Quick answers. Hi, girls. Uh, I just want to to reflect on an observation I had while watching okay. all this. When I saw that man in Morocco destroy things, threatening throwing shares, I was thinking, oh my God, how fragile he is. It was like watching a four-year-old throwing a tantrum. They're like afraid. You see it in their eyes. They're like dreadful almost. Great, keep it to questions. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Magnus, you were, you were next. But also, the ladies are gonna be here for two days. So if you don't see them, um, if you don't, see, you don't get a question now, Jimmy, you can talk to them after. I have one more question. Yeah, th this is a tip. If you want to see more of these wonderful ladies, there is a fantastic exhibition in the room next door with lots of blasphemy, haram doodles. Don't miss it. Question. No question. Question, sorry. guys. <laughs> question ends with a question mark. I'm sorry. All right, one question. I literally have a question. Which? Oh. She has a question. Can I give you my Mariam, just. Yeah. Thank you. All questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Mariam, and um, my question is for you, Ipti. Uh, I do something similar to what you're doing, but in northern Nigeria. And my question will be, um, do you still live in Morocco, where you work? Okay. So how exactly do you handle this, the threats and uh, spy? Have you ever had to deal with a spy amongst your staff? Do you have staff in your organization and the people you work with? I just want to know how it works, because my organization was infiltrated by spies. And... Um, the threat is something else, and with Sarah's program and so many other people, lovely people, I've been able to deal with, you know, the mental health that comes with the, the, the toxicity of, of threats and so many other things. I just want to hear from you. You, you run an organization. How do you oh, do oh. it? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I live in Morocco, um, and I'm a nomad, and I live in Paris, but I travel a lot because of my activism. But yes, I live in Morocco, and I'm doing... Uh, all uh, these uh, actions and uh, campaigns in Morocco. Uh, a lot of interviews with the uh, national press and international press. And I think my answer is that my weapon is uh, that uh, I have a lot of um, international organize organizations and pr international press by my side. So I know that's why I do not have, I, I'm not in prison. I have a lot of problems, intimidations, arrestation, uh, arrests, and uh, and uh, some trials, but uh, uh, that's why I'm I'm here, 
and um, about the organization it's not an, an association it's not a, it's a collective it's a movement so we are a very 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 small group working on uh, our these issues or helping women or um, to organize campaigns actions etc so but yeah few years ago um, there was like a lot of people in uh, Mali, but in our uh, movements, but there was like uh, fake activists. So uh, that's why uh, from like, I don't, I don't know, 2019, so recently, uh, we are like a small, small, small group. Can you, you know, you, you had one liner to do and as we all get up, go on. Um, I was just going to say, I think for anyone out there that is actually thinking about creating any, becoming a content creator, becoming an activist, one thing I would say is don't worry about the Muslims. Actually just ignore them. That's the one rule that I have. I don't even talk to any Muslims because you know what? I'm actually there for ex-Muslims and that's it. Um, and nobody else really matters to me. So just I think if you really kind of create your own boundaries, you protect yourself and your safety and your mental health. So that's all I have. Perfect. Thank you so much, ladies.